I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This week in the Poetry of Predicament podcast, we'll be exploring the leading edge of human potential training, facilitation, and space holding in a time of immense challenge and predicament with our guest, Vera Franco. Hi there. This is Dean Walker, and this is another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a YouTube channel. And uh, if you've been watching this podcast for the past, I don't know, roughly five years that it's been running, you'll know that in the past couple of years, I've really been leaning on um, including people who have something to say, something to contribute to uh, how humanity might be able to individually and collectively face human caused collapse of earth and human systems and primarily the thread of continuity between a number of different bodies of work that i'm including in these podcasts with this theme is the theme of transformation and um without going into a, a whole discourse about transformation let it be said that it's, uh, in my experience, it is not the same as change at any level. It may involve great amounts of change, but something that is transformative, well, to give you an example, the most famous uh, example of transformation that I'm aware of is that of the, the uh, caterpillar into the butterfly, that uh, that which is literally the deconstruction, disruption, the decimation of life as the caterpillar knows it, then turns into quite an extraordinary, even miraculous life in the form of, of a butterfly. So I'm not at all trying to say that every instance of transformation has this kind of beauty that comes out of the, uh, the transformational process. What I can say is that it is always life-giving and in its own extraordinary way. And it has very little to do with what we as humans might prefer, might want to uh, be the outcome that, is, that we would uh, rather have show up in the process of some great change or transformation. One of the bodies of work that I include in this imaginary toolkit that I use for myself to find practices of reconnection and also to offer to other people who uh, engage with this work of livingresilience.net and our learning series called Deep Academy. And even those who watch these videos in the Poetry of Predicament. So in today's episode of Poetry of Predicament, I'm including a uh, person who's at a quite a senior level uh, in the trainer body of an organization called P uh, Possibility Management. And you've, uh, if again, if you've watched this podcast over the years, you've seen a number of interviews with uh, their various trainers or the founder of, of the work called, named uh, Clinton Callahan. Today's episode is an uh, interview with uh, Vera Franco, who is one of the trainers for possibility management. And uh, I'm just going to break straight in uh, after I get through talking here and introducing this episode. I'm going to just be breaking straight into the conversation where uh, we find Vera in um, the Yucatan, where she has just recently chosen to embark on a, a spur of the moment vacation, uh, a holiday in which she's quite intentionally breaking away from the intensity of her work for the past few months and getting a break to hopefully do some writing. 
she'll tell us a little bit about that, but just to put it into context for you. And um, for people who don't quite get what this work is in Living Resilience and Deep Academy and so on, I, uh, I really want to um, make clear that while there are some similarities between this possibility management and living resilience and the work that, that I do over here, not to mention a number of other bodies of work that I draw on and uh, many, many of whom I've had interviews with their staff and with their senior students and so on. This particular interview is, uh, and in fact, literally the first thing we talk about when we open up this interview, you know, I'm basically asking what takes you to the Yucatan? <laughs> Pretty casual question. And uh, what I'd like to ask you to pay attention to is where Vera goes to share about what she's been through in the past few months and what she's doing there now. And particularly, she shares about an, uh, an energetic experience, uh, kind of a, a breakthrough, if you will, in how she deploys her attention and out of that, how she relates to elements of the living earth. And it's, it's an interesting moment, um, more than interesting, but I'm trying to be diplomatic. I, I was deeply, deeply moved, as you'll see, by where she chose to position herself as she shared what she shared, meaning she was uh, so sharing deeply from the energy of the, the, uh, the content that she was sharing. You'll, you'll hear it and it'll make sense when she tells her story. And she was also uh, emanating so uh, remarkably the, the feeling body that she was present to in this breakthrough uh, in her relationship with the earth. And that, in fact, that place right there, that position of uh, the intersection of energy body and feeling body, and of course, our physical body and mental body, that proportion is a very familiar proportion to me. It is far more about the energetics of a given moment than any of the other bodies. Not that it's one's better than the other, it's just a different proportion. And it, it literally, you'll see that it just cracks me open to find someone from a possibility management group uh, having that similar proportion of how she deploys her attention and how she presences herself. Um, from then on, I, she just, she, <laughs> they said, uh, Jerry Maguire, she had me at hello given that proportion. Why I'm going into so much detail is that this is a big part of the kind of transformation-based work that we offer in Living Resilience. And it's why I am bringing together these extraordinary people for these interviews in the Poetry of Predicament. Because, you know, frankly, if if the best a person has is the mental body and the physical body and a pretty stunted feeling body for most of us in this world. Uh, and we, we were flooded daily by uh, social media as opposed to full on, full range uh, relationships with others. Um, we don't stand much of a chance in terms of having rich, full lives in the face of the predicament laden world that we're living in. It is, people who have this ability to access and fully inhabit all of the five bodies, which you'll hear about in the interview, and to be able to shift proportions of our presence within them, that is an, an incredibly empowering skill set to have. And so I would invite you to watch. And if this is something that's familiar to you, then you will get it, I predict. If it's new to you, uh, this is something to really bask in, to really appreciate. Uh, it's like watching people who are really good at theater up on the stage and just 
mesmerizing us with their abilities. Um, that's how it shows up for me is a, a, there's a deep nourishment of the spirit of, of uh, the energy body in particular here in this interview. So uh, you uh, guess now you've been warned, you won't be so surprised that we just go straight in. And, and basically uh, Vera is just answering the question, what took you to the Yucatan? Uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, particular interview. And if it compels you in any way, all the details about how to get a hold of the, um, the rich offering that is the possibility management body of work, those links will be in the show notes as will all the links you could ever need to connect with Living Resilience Deep Academy and our community of practice where this is the nature of the work that we do to expand our own capacities to be present, present in the face of a predicament laden world. So I hope you enjoy uh, even half as much as I did uh, as you experienced this interview. Thanks so much for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you next time as well. Uh, we were in a, a, a eco-village community in Schloss Larisseg in, in Switzerland. And from then I've been in every week a training space. And so I thought I, I'd like to have a bit of time to kind of integrate that experience. You think? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it's you know almost three months of every week, and I pioneered just a couple of different um, trainings, like the online expand the box training. Yes. So it's been mainly been done for years and years and years on site, and I've been one of the two people bringing it to the online format. And it's a steep learning curve and thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and so I just kind of wanted to take some stock and, and to see, okay, how, how can this evolve as well? How can the online expand the box evolve? Mm -hmm. What is so much more is possible that I thought in the online spaces, like I've been doing a lot of experiments with groups and individuals and so much more is possible. So I wanted to take some stock. And, and also there's something that's been happening a lot in my life where from August, since August, I, I went through some um, initiation processes of bringing my full being more into this world. Mm -hmm. And I became extremely sensitive to plants, to the plant world, mm -hmm. to feeling deeply, deeply moved and touched and connected to plants and trees and, and <clears throat> even the tiniest lichen as they were part of my body, as they're like a finger yes. or a hand. Or, and so the way that it expressed is whenever I'm in a, a garden or even looking at plants at the side of the road, I just started crying, crying with gratitude that the plants are there. Yeah. And so I was in one of these walks in nature and crying and crying and crying, just looking at little plants and saying, hey, thank you for being here. Thank you for for not dying of a broken heart. Mm -hmm. And and this and I, I asked, OK, so what do I need? Like, what 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 do I need to do about this sadness? What, what do I need? What it, what is it asking of me? And you know, the answer came inside me as, okay, go to a place with a lot of nature, mm -hmm. go to a place where it's still a little bit wild. And so this, you know, the, the image or the, the name Mexico came in. Mm -hmm. I'm just following that impulse and see where it takes me. So I don't actually know why I'm here completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm but just I'm pausing. Hoping. I'm just pausing for a moment to Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you so much for. Um, uh, just got a number of waves going on. Uh, <clears throat> so 
So I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be speaking with you. It's, it's a joy and <clears throat> I'm already <laughs> so far beyond what I was expecting or hoping for that uh, we're, we're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, can you say what's, what's inside you? What is moving in you? Oh you know, yeah, I'm, I'm about to. I'm just uh, yeah. <clears throat> just trying to be with it. Pretty big waves. So the, the first wave is uh, was a multiple impressions in my system at the same time. Uh, some having to do with my relationship with with Clinton and and Chloe and possibility management in the the number of things that I've experienced and and how I've included it uh, possibility management at large in what I call my invisible toolkit for my own practices and also for the practices for people who participate in my work. Um, there's, uh, <clears throat> there are a number of things that uh, transformation based work and work that includes multiple bodies, including the energy body in particular. These are all very, very important things. And that's a big part of why I included this work and continue to include this work in, in my own and uh, refer people to possibility management people uh, often. There's a whole, there are a number of distinctions, a number of elements that um, we, we either say very, very differently or I don't know if they exist at all in possibility management. It's fine. I mean, of course, there's going to be differences. But what I just experienced in your sharing, just in that brief layout of your motivation, your recent shifting, and, and what has you be where you are, and, and how that's moved you in your relationship, which now seems quite deep with the plant world, that uh, goes right to, it just went right to the heart. I, I will do, I do this a lot. I, I, this is the area of, of implicit system or implicit senses, a number of other organs of perception besides the ones we're used to talking about. And this is the overlap of this with the energy body is primarily the, the realm of my body of work. And when you shared what you shared, it so fully came, just washed in, in this beauty, with this beauty. <laughs> and for you to share that and you being so deeply engaged and so full of the enthusiasm and the sincerity of your, your love of the possibility management work, it, it was a remarkably healing moment in addition to a validation, in addition to a sense of resonance and, and connection with you that I haven't had yet. It just, we haven't connected you know, much. So it's, so there was a lot there. <laughs> and uh, I was hoping we might kind of nudge up against this, these distinctions and how do we bridge and, is there a need to bridge or, you know, and so on. And um, well, you took care of that. So I guess we have to find something else to talk about. <laughs> yes, this could be an emerging conversation. <laughs> yes, it, it promises to be. <laughs> and thank you. I'm also touched by how how it moved you and how how it seemed to me you know some something in my body just really responded the, of the way that you feel and the way that you um use your own body to to relate to the world to to relate with nature and mm -hmm. just that presence um it, it, it's more than the words that you said it's really yes i my, I know what you're talking about. Like we resonate really. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The, you know, for lack of a better word, the implicit system, the implicit senses. Um, 
and then combining that with some of the the st distinctions and dynamics of of the energy body um and it's uh <laughs> well you know so um <clears throat> You know, I'm going to have to do some voiceover beginning, you know, introducing how we just went straight into it. So there was really no introduction and so on. Um, yes. I'll, take, I'll take care of that part. I, I love the uh, freedom that post-production gives. Mm, um, but I'm wondering that uh, I've, I've been so really curious uh, because I, I felt a, a little loss uh, when we didn't connect as much as I might have liked with a bunch of people in two different labs in Mallorca in 2019. It's, it was, we had a few other things going on. <laughs> and I hear that you have been engaged in a very intensive way since then. And I'm curious if you would be willing to share uh, how you would like to be known. If, if you would introduce yourself and, and share how you would like to be known now. Um, I would appreciate it. Um, and that, that might be a good place to start. I imagine there will be a few uh, possible sparks for more conversation just out of that sharing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that invitation. Um, I am, well, I can say that my name is still Vera Frank. <laughs> it's still <laughs> Vera Frank. And I am, I am a possibility manager, management trainer, and I am an explorer, a, um, a researcher. I'm mostly an explorer and a researcher. And with this deep question that I've carried since, I think since I was 14 about what else is possible or is this all that is possible that we create? When I, when I was 14, I would look at the world, look at my parents, look at other people's parents. You know, we could put people in outer space and, and have these big flying machines and really heavy things that can fly across the space. And then I thought, so why do we still have all of these wars and these disparities? And how, how do we still relate in a fairly similar way as before, as, as in previous decades and centuries? And is this all that is possible? You know, someone dreamed to go into space. What other culture? What other societies can we create? And so I'm a researcher of what else is possible. And I am one that loves, that, that feels this ecstasy of being at the cusp of, of that new possibility, of, of not knowing what comes next and still staying there. And it's a, it's a, a, a the location of this edge is scary. It's absolutely scary because of the unknown, because of the groundlessness, because of the unpredictability. There's really no ground, nowhere to hold. And it is where I feel most alive, where I feel most that I am truly, um, I'm not sleeping, I'm truly awake and I'm alert and and I, I, when I do this, when I tune in, I, I can totally rely on all of the resources, the inner resources and outer resources, this complete reliance that the, the world and the universe is intimately connected and, that I, and, that I, and it's resourceful for the next step. So I'm a researcher in that sense. What, what next? Can be possible. What is the next thing? What is the, what is it needed? Yeah. Well, beautiful. That's a that's a wonderful start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm wondering if you could uh, help me out a little bit. 
there are people who are far more uh, articulate or eloquent than I am. There are people who have far more uh, just innate ability to uh, experience and articulate systems awareness and interconnectedness better than I can. And all of these things are, are really important to the work that I'm doing and I believe to the work that you're doing also. And, and so I'd like to ask a favor that we could just look at a, a few very simple uh, quotes that most people have heard. And it's sometimes through these simple quotes that I can find a way to speak about this kind of transformation-based work with people who have never had uh, that kind of conversation and people who didn't grow up with that kind of insight bubbling out of you as a child, as it did for me as a child as well. So let me just put out these simple quotes and, and see if you can help me bridge using some of the distinctions, some of the experiences that you're talking about. And, and anything else that comes to you, because I am sincere in my desire to seek out um, the, the wisdom, the, the suggestions, the experiments of how can this be conveyed in a way that it lights up a little possibility that might not have come as a child, that might not have come even all the way through adulthood for a person. But there's still, as I think you know, perhaps even better than I do, that there is a way in which that can get ignited, even if a person has never thought of something like that before. Yes? Yes. yes. So let's, let's just roll these out and see what you, see what you think. One of them is uh, <clears throat> Albert Einstein is uh, attributed to have said something like the problems that we encounter today cannot be solved at the same level at which they were created. Something like that is the quote that's pretty common. Mm -hmm. Most people yeah. have heard of it. So there's that one. And the other one is a kind of a partial quote, really more of an impression that um, Charles Eisenstein uses quite often. And he invites us to imagine a world, a more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. And there's something about those two different quotes that seems to nudge people closer to a little spark, a spark of some possibility outside of the life they've lived up till now. The understandings they've had up till now, the box or the uh, inner cons construct that that in which they've lived up till now, and I I would like to just do a little poetic license here. I mean, first I'm doing this because what I believe possibility management is up to, and what I, I'm clear that my own work is up to is uh, bringing forth transformation-based work. work. This is not work about just changing a few elements in a person's life so they're more efficient, so they can be more successful. This is about transforming. This is about truly the, the deconstruction or desaturation from one way of being and inviting an entirely new and consciously created and consciously invited new possibility. Is that Fair to say, are we, are we yeah. doing okay, okay so far? Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to just add a little bit to the Einstein quote, because I think he was a thinker. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's how they talked about stuff when, you know, we need a new way of thinking and the old way of thinking and so on. I, I would just like to add to it, thinking doing, being, feeling, relating, creating, and, you know, just kind of that dot, dot, dot. So I just want to give that yeah. poetic license and put it in there. This long question is really an invitation for you to share how, how do you share the beauty and the 
nearly miraculous quality that I would say is in the experience of transformation. How do you open up that conversation with someone who may never have had that experience, might have a tiny inkling of, well, I guess I get it about what Einstein's saying, or gosh, it's inspiring what Charles Eisenstein is saying, but they really just don't have a freaking clue what it would really take to realize a more beautiful world that our heart, hearts know is possible. I'm curious, how do you share with someone who has not touched that yet? Yeah, thank you for this question, Dean, because I often have the, the, this question too of what, how is it that some people hold on to patterns that are um, for many people outside the, the, the people that you know the individuals themselves they know that are um, violent or, or destructive or create results that put them more in misery or in um, discontent let's say and how how is it that some people hold on to patterns like that and and not you know, not do something else. And part of my research has been that, that if people don't know what else could happen, if people don't know what they're missing, it's a bit hard to, to, to look for that transformation. So what I mean is if you are in survival, if you are in a mode of surviving, you know, you, born into this world and you are told that this is how it is. You have to work from nine to five to earn your keep so that you can buy food, so you can uh, have a roof on, a, you know, over you. Uh, and you have to do all of these things. If this is the way that you were taught that life is, and this is how you need to survive. And if you're in like intrinsically um, identified with the, that is the only way that I have to feed myself, to feed my children, then it is a little bit difficult to, to look beyond that survival. So what, what's gonna happen for you, for a person who's in survival is that you're gonna use those strategies that they know work, even if they're strategies that seem insane for other people, but they've worked because they're alive. So this is, these strategies are developed in an early age, you know, it's a part of our comfort zone, our coping mechanisms, and and they're very, very strong because it's um, it's attached to survival. So to go beyond, to go beyond survival, you know, it's it's um it's a hero's journey. It's a it's a you know one of these superhero or these um, epic uh, decisions and epic choices, epic journeys that a person can, if they want to, can decide to go on. Who am I besides being in this survival this strategy? Who, what can life look like besides this thing that I already know? So in a way, what I see is that the, the person that's themselves, if, if you're in this survival, you need to be, enough disappointed with what you have. You need to feel enough of what it's causing in your life, in the life of your loved ones, to even dream about creating something else. And so for me, one of the biggest impediments to feel that pain is the variety of ways that people can numb their feelings. So if I, if I numb my feelings with, um, with drinking alcohol or, or drinking coffee, you know, or, or overwork or over exercise or consume or and never stop to really think or feel the pain of what, how your living is causing you, then it's very difficult to want to move. 
So it's just, it's a it's part of that survival strategy to stay you know to stay numb. And and I think most human beings in this world, they can feel it. They're 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 really like we live in a society like modern culture is a cons super consumerist society, and I think it's because of that because it is gives such an easy gate to numbing, and that's why. It's, it's so popular, buy the next thing, buy the next laptop, buy the next clothes. And, and it's all to, to keep a person from really feeling what's all the stuff, things that are happening in the world, the destruction of, of life, all life on planet earth, the, the destruction of people's health as well, of the, the kind of food that we eat, the, the loss of um, biodiversity, not even not having enough trees in a city really affects the psychology and the, the energetic body's health and well-being. And so people get more and more numb. More and more numb than means that you don't that you don't feel that pain that you want to transform. Mm -hmm. So how would you how would I um, bring that little spark for people? One way is to really is to to create ways to create doors for okay, other other ways of living are possible. So there's multiple people around the world creating organizations, NGOs, uh, communities, eco villages. They're cultural creatives basically, and they're they're creating little game worlds, little organizations where people can experience themselves differently. Even, even sometimes festivals, some, some conscious festivals that people can just go and say, wow, people here are so friendly. I've never felt like this, that I could just look at people in the eyes and, and really feel seen. You know, more and more are these um, you know, workshops and, and, and spaces where people can, can have nonviolent communication, can, do, can experience being. And experience a little bit more space of being beyond the survival. This is what you need to do. And still, a lot of these workshops and trainings are available to people who are already thinking that something new can be possible, not really to the people who are in survival, right? Mm -hmm. So the people who are usually from back much poorer backgrounds, right? So that spark, in my opinion, and in my, in my research, that spark is already there. That spark for a new world is possible is already there. And it's in the love, in the love that the people have for their children, in the love that people have for you know, their, their garden. And it's, it's more and more of my work has to do with allow people to be deeply moved and deeply connected to their feelings and deeply connected to their hearts and their bodies because that that resource, their physical body, their emotional body, their energetic body, it will give you the the next step. It will give you the, all the information that the person needs to to seek that that thriving that, that thrivability mm -hmm. for a new world. So, yeah, most of my work is nowadays about helping people to learn how to feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate the bridge from the, the macro from the large, large scale down to the most intimate scale of what matters most in a, in a person's life. I, I think that's um, it's an important gift for anyone who's going to be of service to others in this transformation-based work is to be able to shift scale quite fluidly. And so you you did that and thank you, yeah. Can I, can I add something? Oh, please. Yeah, so exactly what you said, to really connect to the thing that matters the most to the individual, to the, to the people. And this is why a lot, a lot of people think that possibility management is a, about conscious feelings work. It's about feelings work. And it actually isn't. We, it's about initiation work. It's about 
uh, culture transformation and cultural evolution work. But to get there, people need to be connected deeply with their feelings. And it is exactly for that that you said, is to connect to what's really essential and really important for them. For example, your anger. Your anger, like modern culture, like the mainstream worldwide culture says to people from since birth that being angry is wrong or bad because it's violent and aggressive and whatnot. And this is, if one change of that perspective about anger, and this is part of the work that we do in possibility management, is that anger, instead of being seen as something bad, if it's worked in consciously, it can be a really important resource because what you're angry about, what you're really, really angry about is what you care about. And if it's something that you care that deeply, you know, it is also the thing that you came here on earth to change. So anger is deeply, not deeply connected to your love, it's deeply connected to your purpose. And so this, the anger doesn't live outside people's bodies, it lives inside every single human being on earth. So they hold every single human being on earth, holds the key to their own essence and their own purpose. And this is absolutely revolutionary because a lot of in, you know, the biography of civilization, a, a lot of um, religions have said, okay, you look for purpose outside yourself. You look for purpose. You know, God is gonna give you this. The priest is gonna tell you what to do. And it, actually the key is inside you, each single person. So if you if you find the way to, to consciously start feeling anger, not as a bad thing, but as a resource, and to start learning how to navigate your emotions in a way that they are useful, then you can find what is really important to you and what's really the purpose of you being here. Oh, so that's all you wanted to add. Okay. <laughs> you gave me a perfect key for that. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> and you know, the same for the other four feelings, the sadness and the fear and the joy. Each of these four, you know, anger, sadness, fear, and joy have their own, it's it's their own energetic fuel for something in your life, you know, your anger can give you that power to act, to connect with what's really important and to act, to change it, you know, to change the paradigm, to change your life to something that you want to do. And the sadness, you know, instead of seeing a sadness as something wrong that's happening, sadness is the, it's the energy, it's the fuel that allows people to connect with each other, to listen. Listening with sadness is gives a totally different result than listening with anger or listening with fear. And, and, and fear who has such a bad reputation on the planet because people can, you know, this a fear uh, mongering from governments and, and from the media. This is because most people on the planet do not know how to be with their own fear, do not know how to um, consciously feel fear and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And so if we could feel fear, if every single human being on this planet could be with their fear without feeling like they're gonna die or like thinking that it's a bad thing, the, that human being will not be controlled anymore by anyone. No control from other people's fears because you could be with that fear and still decide centered about what you want to do. And so, all of these feelings, and I enjoy as well, the joy is this emotional energy that is absolutely necessary to celebrate and to invite. And so much we are missing that on, on the planet, really, the, this joy, this, this let's invite people to come together to collaborate instead of competing and, and getting to the top. So each of these feelings have amazing information and resource for your life. If you start changing your relationship from it's bad or good to it's a, it's a, it's a resource. Yeah. Mm. 
You know, back in your introduction, you spoke about uh, an affection that you have for um, taking the occasional walk on the edge, the edge of what's comfortable, the edge of what's familiar, the edge of what has been possible up till now and so on. And um, there's another term that's often used for that kind of stroll, that, that kind of walk. And that is uh, to invite a, a liquid state, something that is for the average person in the business as usual paradigm, in the uh, patriarchal paradigm, which is so much about control at every level. And that control in my body and in my system, in my psychology, is, is a rigidity, is a, the illusion of a predictability. You know, like if we talk about economics and the market, the market hates uncertainty. And you hear that from economists and pundits on the television. There's too much uncertainty in the markets and blah, blah, blah. So there's uh, certainly in the shamanic and other energetic lineages that I've been involved with, there is this notion of, uh, of a far more liquid state, something, something that's close to the opposite of that kind of rigid, tightly gripped uh, fixation on reality must stay this way because it's been this way and this is the way it will always be. It's kind of a, that lineage. And I'm, so I'm curious if you could share a bit more about your, um, your obviously cultivated uh, in, enjoyment of being on that edge, that edge that most people run away from or avoid at any cost. And if and if if you are inclined, if you could say anything about your relationship with a liquid state and as a part of that. Yeah, thank you. There's this this journey to the edge of of your familiar, you know, your comfort zone. It's also often described in different areas as um, your growth zone or learning zone. And this is, this is perfect because in the comfort zone, inside your box of everything that's familiar, everything that's safe, it's, you already know what's gonna happen. So it's, you're already, you're not learning something new. You're not gonna learn anything new. So if you want to learn anything, if you wanna evolve, if you wanna grow, you need to get out of that comfort zone, right? So that's, the, that's what people call the growth zone. That journey, most people don't do it because they start experiencing one of the four feelings, which is fear. And of course, like I said just before, in mainstream capitalist patriarchal culture, fear is seen as bad. So then I, I go to the edge of my own comfort zone and I feel fear. Oh my God, no, 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 back up, back up. Let's go back to safety, back to safety, back to safety. And I think that enough people have also experienced that, you know, if you, if you go on an adventure, you know, if you go, okay, I'm going to backpack for a month on South America, a lot of people do this or go to Europe, they they feel this excitement and excitement is basically a mix of two emotions and joy and fear. And it's absolutely necessary to feel both joy and both fear to go into that edge of the comfort zone and then into that liquid state. So liquid state, I am going to, I am defining it as uh, the lack of solidity of the certainty of your comfort zone. So in the comfort zone, your safety is, you know, this is th this is the way it is. It's like this, it works like this. It's like very certain, very solid. But as you walk to the edge of that comfort, 
and you see, wow, more things are possible. Like if you go, let's say to Mexico, where I am right now, people <laughs> eat differently. They have, they have beans for breakfast. They have other things for lunch. They, you know, it's, it's totally different and they can still live like this. And so you're faced with diversity. You're faced with something else than what I know is possible. And so when that hits our familiar comforts or our certainty, it starts to shake it. it starts to shake this, the, 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 the certainty, the solidity of the certainty, and it starts melting away, it starts melting. So this, our certainty becomes a little bit more fluid, a little bit more wobbly, and that is a magic part to be, a magic spot to be, because it's only when your certainties are a little bit fluid that new thought where new distinctions, new opportunities, new possibilities can really be real for you and you can be finally transformed. So, because you can't transform only in your mind. It has to be a lived experience. So a person can learn about uh, the Yucatan in, in Mexico by books, and they can think that they know a lot of the Yucatan and it's information, <laughs> or they can come to the Yucatan and look at the people and, and eat what they eat and, and uh, experiment, uh, you know, jumping in the cenotes, in the, in the swimming pools, going to the ruins. And it's a totally different experience. It, one adds information, like the intellectual knowing adds information to the brain the second one, this lived experience transforms intrinsically and transforms the human being. And so this is the journey that we do in the transformational work. We go not in our minds, but with our whole, all our five bodies, we go to the edge of that comfort zone and we become liquid. That certainty becomes liquid and it has, um, it has symptoms, let's say symptoms in all our four, five bodies. It has symptoms in our intellectual body, uh, some, some people might be forgetful or um, might feel a bit confused and like, I don't know what's going on, which is totally appropriate for a transformational work, not knowing what's going to happen next and not knowing what's going on. They might feel liquid in their emotional body, so they might start feeling fear and other emotions and, and, and also liquid in their physical body, like being really sleepy or... Oh, like having belly aches. And so this is all part of experiencing something completely new that they didn't know existed. And so the way that I've been, um, be, that I have been with liquid state is that I have gone through multiple liquid states in um, spaces where it's been held, like the space has been held for me uh, in groups, but also I've, been through enough liquid states in my life through traveling, through moving to another country, so, you know, so really leaving all of my comfort zone from my country of birth to another completely different country, different culture. And I realized that I can survive it. Gosh, I can survive it. I know what the symptoms are. And, and so this is, it's like a, a distinction. I have my X on the map. Oh, this is not me going crazy. This is a liquid state. Oh, this is not something is wrong with my life. This is a liquid state. And so this, um, this distinction has allowed me to, when I am in liquid state, I just do self-care mm -hmm. and I let it be. And I really let myself go into the liquid state. I give myself some time. And suddenly the sensation that people describe in liquid state, like falling, because it's like there's groundlessness. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the sensation of falling becomes a sensation of flying. After enough times being in that liquid state and knowing that I'm not gonna die or that just parts of me are dying, but a new me is emerging, I suddenly feel like that the exact sensation of falling is actually the exact sensation of flying. And this mm -hmm. is how I've been, yeah, relating to liquid states. Yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, five bodies. And uh, I'm wondering if for the folks who are watching this podcast for the first time, if you would lay out what are those five bodies? Yeah, thank you. 
for asking this question because it's you know many different traditions all over the world, many different worldviews, even have more than five bodies. So with the work that I do, uh, we have, which is possibility management, and it's based in experiences, like experiments. So everything that comes out of this work is because we've actually discovered by experimenting, so it's not a, a big theory, um, is that we have five distinct bodies. And if they're distinct, we distinguish them because they have different purposes, different foods, different um, kinds of pain and different kinds of ecstasy. So because they have such distinct uh, ways of being, we call them five different bodies. So it's the physical body, the intellectual body, the energetic body, the emotional body, and the archetypal body, which is the archetypal body has just been discovered in our uh, body of work in the last couple of years. And so the physical body, we know it's, it's very, it's, yeah, our muscles and our bones, and it's, you can feed them with water and grains and fruits and vegetables. And our emotional body is basically our emotions and our feelings, our sadness, our gladness, our fear, um, and our joy. And so you feed it by feeling. You can feed it by, by feeling and being heard in your feeling, being witnessed in, 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 in this feeling, in consciously feeling. Our intellectual body, which is our mind, it's our thoughts and ideas and, and beliefs, and it can be fed with books. You know, it's, it's the body actually that is most fed on, in modern culture. You know, a little bit of the physical body, especially if you're into sports, but it's mostly our head. And then we have the energetic body that also is not really spoken, just like the emotional body is not really spoken or uh, we don't learn a lot about it in, in school at all. And it's about our perception of space. What, you know, we all know when someone's a bit too close to us, you know, someone's sat really close to us because without even thinking, we kind of move away. This is the intelligence of our energetic body. It's our sense of space and timing, sense of rhythm, sense of space, a sense of timing. And it's very much, uh, it's much, much subtler. And it's obviously all these four bodies are interconnected. And so it really can expand and contract uh, in relationship with your environment. And then there's the archetypal body. The archetypal body kind of turns on. It's about purpose and your life purpose and, and the work that your spirit, like your soul, that your being really wants to um, make happen in the world. And this archetypal body comes into action, gets activated when the four uh, other bodies are in balance. So that it is fed by living your purpose. It is fed by delivering the things on earth that you're, you're destined to do. Yeah. Yeah, better. That, that was so useful. Um, you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that in particularly in 2019, <clears throat> when I uh, really started to uh, increase the volume of uh, conversations with people like yourself, people who have something to say at scale, um, how they have chosen to engage being in service to life is what I would say you and me and many others are have found our way of doing that. If it's in training, if it's in uh, health care, you know, there are just so many ways to do that. And this is uh, the first time that I've asked any of the folks from possibility management to lay out that distinction for us of five bodies. And I really appreciate that. And I'm, again, embarrassed to say that I, I let it go so long without uh, asking for that mapping um, because of the reluctance that you've spelled out so well in the average person trying to keep the, either the numbness level or the disengagement level high enough so they don't have to feel anything. Um, it's, uh, it's been too easy for me to not ask for that mapping 
And I think it's been a, a big missing, a big uh, missing portion of the conversation for, for those folks who are giving some thought to, okay, how can I engage more with life? How can I grow this spark? And so thank you for that. I, I just think that was um, quite important, so. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say that it's, it's exactly because we don't have these distinctions in modern culture, modern culture doesn't hold these distinctions that everything gets so confused. You know, we know if we say our body is all of this, and then we don't have names for what happens when someone comes very close to us, or, or that, you know, we, we have sense for timings, you know, when something is really it's the, right, the right people, the right thing, but it's not the right time for something to happen. So we have kind of some language around that, but it's almost accidental where we, we don't know how to use it. And so if, and it's not new age, it's not really hippie or anything at all. It's just, if we start distinguishing the different layers that we already hold, mm -hmm. then we can use them as tools. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'd like to just take a real risk here uh, of going to the next level in this distinction. And, and it blends with things you've said before a few minutes ago. It blends with the notion of being able to let go of outcome. So in my experience, that's, that's one of the early steps when someone really starts to approach transformation. There's one of the tightest gripped places in my, in my experience, if in myself and in many people I work with, is this deep addictive core attachment to outcomes in life. I mean, it's literally how many, perhaps most of us define ourselves is by the outcomes we imagine for ourselves and more importantly, the outcomes we've actually realized. And we hold on to those and that process and that identification fiercely. And so I, I'd like to just share a little bit for myself and my one chapter of my now love of the liquid state, but I, I don't wanna to lie to people. It, there have been times when it's just fucking, like this is insane. It's been the, some of the most uncomfortable shit, like get me the fuck out of here. You know, it's uh, extraordinarily uncomfortable when I'm confronting a place where I'm holding on so very tightly. And this idea of letting go and, and letting go is its own chapter that I could share at at length and perhaps we all could. But this idea of letting go of outcome, I, I just wanted to share a uh, relatively recent chapter of it. About five years ago, I was um, finishing up writing my first and only book called The Impossible Conversation about uh, being collapse aware and how to bring transformation into one's experience, no matter how aware we are of the really dire predicament that we're in. I remember making some choices of what to include in that book because the, the shock value in some of what I ended up including, the shock value of just what we're truly facing on this planet, it, it's extraordinary. And I had uh, people and I, people I love dearly right now. I mean, I love them then, love them now, and I respect them hard to overstate how much I respect and appreciate them. And they had agreed to give me some feedback about my book. Ironically, I was holding on to 
I need to do what they tell me to do because it's the right thing to do. And that I'm lucky to have their input. And this is the way it's supposed to go is you find somebody to help or edit or suggest or mentor and you follow them and so on. Ironically, it's, it's a little bit inverted in this story. And I realized I, I couldn't, I, I, couldn't and I I was confronting I might lose them as friends they might experience this as a disrespect of them and and on and on there was so much wrestling with if I were to tell my truth and take this path in what I include in the book and the body of work and so on I I might lose people very precious to me and um and on top, on top of that, I could sabotage the book ever being read by very many people. So I hope you get a sense of the, the wrestling I was doing with the elements. Yeah. And the, the liquid state was in the direction of finding a way to express what appeared to be the emergent truth in, in my system. And I, I really had to let go. I had to be ready to let go of these precious relationships and the possible outcome that my book would just not be read. That it would, it would be heresy, it would be junk, it would be, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm including this story because uh, I wanted to share some of the deep wrestling and deep, um, maybe the right word to use here is transforming of something that I was dreading, something that I was despairing, something that I was fearing, and really no promise of that, that liquid state turning out in any positive way that I could point to using my usual ways of describing when things are going well. I had to literally let go of any evidence that this was a pleasant thing, or this was a positive thing, or this was, you know, the, the outcome would be swell <laughs> in any direction. There was no promise. And of, of course there never is, but you get, you get the dynamic. So I, I wanted to say that at the risk of sharing something that's a little kind of rough and no, oh, that's an unpleasant part of the story. Why don't we have Vera talk some more? <laughs> and I, I wanted to just share a real part of a recent, a relatively recent time of being in a liquid state, being very much on the edge of my comfort zone, be way, way beyond my comfort zone, but on the edge of what's possible and how to even be there without any of the usual uh, safety lines or comfort areas or so on. And I guess how I could sum it up is I could say that there is, in my experience, there is an aliveness that is so deeply authentic that um, it is inarguable. It just is. And I could fairly safely say that's the only outcome that I came through that chapter with was that level of aliveness. And I'm taken back to when we first started talking and you shared about this new level of relatedness and connection that you're feeling with plants. And there was something so potent that it just impulsed out into my system immediately. It's that quality of aliveness and connection 
that I'm trying to describe yeah. is the one thing that I was left with after that chapter of letting go into a more liquid state. I'm curious if that brings you to share anything. Yes. Oh my God, Deans, thank you so much for, for this vulnerability. You know, you share so much of yourself here and, and it's, it's exactly, it's exactly, this is the epic move. This is this um, hero's commitment that is necessary for transformation. When you said you basically you were facing with, maybe I won't have these respectful friends in my life anymore. Maybe no one's going to read my book. And on the other hand, you had a commitment. You had a commitment to the authenticity of the book that somehow not knowing how it was gonna turn out that what how you wrote it needed to be said in, that, in, in somehow that way, right? And this commitment is the, this is the epic st stand. This is taking a stand for something bigger than our safety, something bigger than your comfort, something bigger than the status quo of your social life or your social standing. And this is the, this is the point of transformation that goes into the liquid state. So I have, as especially as a trainer, I, I need to be in these, points very often because how can how can transformation how can a trainer really deliver training or, or create spaces of transformation while being protected from transformation themselves right so as a trainer i need to also be at the edge pretty much every time that i'm doing i'm, I'm at the edge right now so one of the my personal um, liquid states that i have in this this big fear of losing losing my safety is about writing i have this from maybe also from school i've been having these oh i need to write in a particular way or i need to to be intelligent i need to 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 look like i know something that i have certainty or i need to write in a way that bedazzles people that that really inspires and and me not being a native English speaker, and you know, that's the language that I write. And also that this is like fears that I have, the little, like kind of little fears. And then I had um, for a very long time, bigger fears. Like, what if I don't have anything to say? What if actually I choke? Um, and I'd be, I, I, I'm seen as this person who's messy and doesn't really know what she's talking about. And nobody ever gonna pay attention to the, the gifts that I do have to share. And then the next level of my fears were, what if, what if people do hear what I say? And this is when I started going deeper into, oh my goodness, what if people really hear? And then the responsibility that I have in my communication. What about the consequences of me saying things that could be really radical, could be really heartbreaking? And then having you know people knocking on my door saying, how can you say these things? Or, you know, so I have I have a commitment to saying it anyway, to say it imperfectly, to to say it as best of my abilities. And when I when I commit to that, when I commit to write writing an article or I commit to doing this interview with you, there's part of what we call the box, the comfort zone that is absolutely freaking out, going like, no, don't publish this. People will find you and, and point out your contradictions and things like that. But my commitment is to this work, to, to, to being at that edge, to discover something new than to stay safe, safe in my anonymity or safe in my little home, safe in my comfort zone. Because exactly how you experience the aliveness that exists in committing to something bigger than my own safety, the commitment to something um, maybe with the potential of being a little bit greater than what I know, than, than, than my status quo, than my social, social standing with my friends and in the world. This 
is gives me so much more reason to live, so much more reason to get out of bed than to than anything else that I do. So for me, the payoff is very obvious. Of course, I'm going to be at the edge and look like a fool to my box, you know, look like look messy. You know, we have a saying in possibility management, which is there's only two teams and you can only be in one of the two teams. You cannot be in both teams at the same time. You're either in the team of looking good or you're in the team of learning or transformation or growing, but you cannot be in both teams at the same time. It is impossible to learn how to ride a bicycle and just do it perfectly, right? So it's, it's exactly the same thing. I'm learning, I'm looking bad. So my commitment is to do it even if I look bad, even if I am perfect. Mm -hmm. And my, my box that wants to look good and to have it figured out and have a professional kind of stand just totally freaks out. And that is in total liquid state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one amazing distinction that can be really useful for you or for everybody who's listening is that you are not your comfort zone. You are not your box. Mm -hmm. You have a box, you have a, a set of, of coping strategies, you have a set of survival strategies, but you are not them. You are not them. So you can have part of you freaking out by, that you're going to Mexico or you're doing this big interview with someone and you can still, your commitment can still be there. So you can have both things happening at the same time. And the more that you can distinguish that you are not your personality, you are not your habits, you are not your behaviors, you are not your beliefs, your opinions. You do have all of these things, but you are not them. Mm -hmm. The more that you disidentify with them, the more you get space to be, to commit, like you said, like to commit to that authenticity, the mm -hmm. authenticity of your book, the authenticity of where you are. And, and not commit so much to your safety. And in that, in that piece, that's when you can go consciously into that liquid state. And it is, you're right, it is absolutely uncomfortable and heartbreaking, heartbreaking. You know, I had times where I had, was crying and, and really scared and, and just, I don't know if I'm gonna survive. You know, I had this, when I, when I decided to leave, leave Finhorn. I, I lived for in the in Finhorn Eco Village in the northeast of Scotland for over 10 years. I wow. was born in Portugal. I was born in Portugal and I moved about 10 years ago to this eco village in Scotland, which was already this big liquid state. Mm -hmm. And then in 2019, I decided to leave. I decided to, where's my next step in my evolution? Okay, I need to leave, leave this safety, this amazing, beautiful, nourishing safety of the community that I, I called my community. And I was selling my house and I was selling all of these, um, you know, all of the objects, all the furniture, like giving away. And I, I decided to do it in a month. And I would wake up sometimes in the morning with this huge panic going, I'm going to die. This is not possible. I can't just leave this amazing paradise. Yeah. I'm definitely going to die. I'm going to, I was had the plan to go to the United States for a trip. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to die. I'm going to find myself. I'm going to be robbed and I'm going to end up in the street. And um, some, some kind of weird scenario that surely this change means death. Mm -hmm. And so when this happened, what the most important thing for me was to have a community of people, which I'm part of, community of people in possibility management that could help me through these emotional states. So I'm saying that, so I went through emotional healing processes to, to really deal with the intensity of emotion and to stay in that commitment that I wanted to stay in that commitment of leaving. So this is an important piece because transformation cannot happen in just solo. You know, it's true, like no one can do your transformation for you. It's, it's your own personal, but it doesn't happen isolated, insulated. Yeah. So I had a, a group of people who were committed to my evolution who could support me in that. And I think you had the same in your, in your liquid states. There's a, a group of people who could just be with you, um, either hold space for you and your emotions, that I had this 
people holding space for me and my emotions and taking me healing processes so that I can be freer to stay in the commitment. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned about, you know, more than likely I've had that kind of experience of support and circle as well. And yeah, I, I look at the troubles in the world and particularly in this last week where we're recording this a few days after the US Capitol building was attacked by domestic terrorists basically. And we have immense troubles in our country and, and it's not much better in most of the rest of the world as well, especially the, the privileged Western world seems to be having a great deal of shadow wrestling going on. And what's heartbreaking for me is that I just don't know how to convey at scale what the experience is to be at, at that level of vulnerability, at that level of openness to new possibility, at that level of aliveness that you describe of walking on that edge and to have support while doing that. It's, whew. <laughs> it's, uh, it's such an exquisite, messy miracle to be in that quality of relatedness with others who are also walking their edge. It's, it's very difficult for me to find a, a way to convey it even in intimate conversations with friends and family over these decades that I've been involved with this work, it's, it's difficult to convey. That's why mm -hmm. I asked the first question I asked. <laughs> I was hoping you had some special secret sauce. <laughs> it, and, and you do. And it's still quite a challenge. I have one last thing I'd like to just mention. I'll include links to what I'm about to talk about. And I, so I want to acknowledge you and I want to acknowledge Joanna and Martina for a recent conversation. I um, just full disclosure for people who've watched this podcast in this past few months or longer, You've seen a couple of interviews that I did with uh, Martina Nicholas, a German woman who's also very intensively involved with possibility management. And one of her projects recently has been to experiment with doing interviews. And so we, we shared a bit about that. And it's been extraordinary to watch her just take so many of the pieces you and I have talked about today and bring it in her way to the deep and heartful conversations that she's had. And the one I'm wanting to point to is the one with you and Joanna. And I, forgive me if I um, recap it or if I remember it incorrectly, but it, it seemed like you, had, you were sharing with Martina the recent creation of and facilitation of a conversation I think it was amongst women who are in the possibility management community about uh, what I can recall was something about laying down the we internal weapons, if you will, the, the guardedness, the armoring, and the, even the weapons that be can become not just defensive, but of offensive that we set up as, a, that women set up uh, as a way to both protect themselves and also to keep that sense of certainty or safety at whatever level inside somehow to try and keep something safe. And I and what I and so just pause if you will, because I, I hope you'll correct me if I had remembered anything wrongly there. What I'm wanting to acknowledge is um, it's a, it's a very, again, a very potent interview 
all of you having a presence that uh, that just made uh, exploring with you and really receiving what you were saying so easy. So I was so attracted to the absorption of what you all were sharing. And I consider that a gift to be able to, to bring forth that kind of presence. And especially three out of three of you on the screen. Yeah, well done. <laughs> um, another piece I would like to acknowledge you all for is that uh, there, there's a mixed blessing in the immensity of the body of work that is this possibility management stuff. The, we've been talking about some of the basics today. And what people might like to know is that I consider it this immense reservoir of distinctions and experiments and resources beyond, I, I, I just literally couldn't describe it. It's just too huge. And that's at once the most generous offering I've ever seen because they're all just available. You go through the, this first uh, expanding the box workshop that you're putting online and, and basically the doors are thrown open. Here you go, enjoy. <laughs> and what can also happen is that a person, especially someone who's relatively new to the work can think that the jargon or a particular way of talking about these distinctions, specific words and concepts, uh, there can be an attachment to those words and concepts rather than the essence of the work. Mm -hmm. And in this particular interview that I keep referencing, all three of you, the, the center of the presence that I'm acknowledging was the essence of the work. And you brought that essence, each of your own, you in your own way, to that very important question of how can you evolve as women through this difficult place and this difficult habit that some have of armoring and weaponizing and so on. I'm, I'm saying this because I, I want an open conversation amongst different bodies of work that are based in transformation, that are all meaning the best in this world to help each other minimize the, the potholes, minimize the places where we can, the pitfalls that can show up for us and that can become a barrier for new people to understand you know you could have filled that that interview with jargon and i don't remember a moment of it mm. what i remember is the incredible presence because you seemed to be sharing so directly from your experience of being in that conversation it relayed in a way that i felt as a man who has deep respect for the feminine, for women, and for the possibility that women and the feminine bring to these challenging times. I bow down. So I, it was more than just an interview with three women about stuff that happens psychologically and and so on. It, it was quite transformative and uh, nourishing for me to uh, listen to watch that that interview. So thank you for um, receiving that. And I'm curious if there's anything you would like to say or correct about that. Well, first of all, thank you, Dean, for your careful listening ear and, and listening heart. And I think one of the, the, 
biggest qualities that I think you have when you do this in these interviews is the quality of your listening. Um, and I think communication is made, I think primarily by the listening. You know, it's kind of guided by the listening. And so thank you. Thank you for seeing the space, seeing us, the presence so, so clearly. Hmm. And I think you're right. It was not a lot of jargon. The, because the purpose of that conversation was not about instructing people about what possibility management is or not. Mm -hmm. The purpose of that conversation was to explore the question, how can women relate to women in a new culture? How can we make a new culture of women relating to women? And we cannot do that. We cannot dream into, the, into what is possible without also seeing what is there, what, what is happening right now, what is, and, and to dare to go into the painful places, into the spaces that are vulnerable. And so instead of making a, a kind of analysis of how everything kind of is, we also go into ourselves, which is also very much a work in possibility management. It's not just creating theories, is okay, how, how am I doing this in my life with my colleague? And, and I, I love that you brought this piece because we were just talking about community, right? Having people around us that support us in the, in the transformation. So the one big question about how can women relate to women in a new culture, in a culture that creates abundance and more possibility, more healing, more community, you know, instead of the competition and scarcity-based strategies, is the same actual question about how can I really create more collaboration? And how can I create collaboration with men and women? How can I create more collaboration between possibility management and other um, bodies of work? How can I create collaboration, you know, collaboration in general? Mm -hmm. And so if that is the purpose of the, of the conversation, and I love that your book is about the impossible conversation and possible conversations because these questions, the question of what is the essential conversation that you're having is one of the biggest um, vector guidelines in possibility management. We call it the purpose of the conversation. Mm -hmm. so the conversation is about winning. You're already playing the, the game of scarcity competition of a patriarchy, right? But if the purpose of the conversation is to create collaboration, create winning happening, winning happening not even personally for me or personally for another, but that winning happens for everybody. If the purpose of the conversation is to create more possibility, then, and to keep commitment to that purpose, regardless if my comfort zone wants that, or I want other things, that, other parts of me want other things, then something else is possible. And so for me, it's impossible, it's, it's impossible to find new ways of creating collaboration without really going to the shadow, what you call the shadow, right? The unconscious purpose, that part that is a bit darker, uh, the, okay, how, so then the, the question becomes, how am I competing right now with you? Mm -hmm. How am I competing with my sister? How am I sabotaging the work of my sister? How am I sabotaging the work of this other body of work? You know, so, and, and to answer soberly to these questions without going into, oh, I'm doing this, I'm a bad person, because the consequence of seeing that as a bad thing means that it goes into the shadows, to the unconscious even more. Because people don't want to be bad people. So if, it's, if because we all, we all have this, this part of us, our underworld, we call it our underworld, this shadow bits in us, the parts that are irresponsible, the parts that are competitive, the parts that are um, jealous and want to blame, want to avoid responsibility at all costs. We all have that. And the more that we own, the more that, every human owns that part, the responsible part, the more that it, that it has options about it. So if you own your underworld, 
you can have options about your underworld. That means your underworld does not only you. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> shadow work is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. Absolutely essential. Like so, so many mm, worldviews and spiritual um, paths, they, you know, especially not only, but a lot of the 1970s, the kind of new age um, root was all about love and light and love and light and love and light. And if you don't go through your underworld, if you don't go through the bits that are ugly, that are hidden, that are crusty, that are stinky, that are um, that you that most people want to hide, if you don't put them in the light, it's really not possible to go into that bright, radiant upper world, this this love and light, because this would only be a facade. What you're gonna get sideways is you know, all these kind of gurus that are sexual predators, all these um, uh, cults that are actually manipulative and want to take people's monies. So we really insist that in possibility management, we do a lot of shadow work to own, to take responsibility for the ways that we are also creating um, mm -hmm. uh, competition and scarcity in the world. So mm -hmm. that is an absolutely fundamental conversation to have so that real collaboration can happen between people, between sisters, between brothers, between bodies of work. Dara Franco, it's just, uh, it's been a real gift to have. <clears throat> it's been a real gift to have this conversation and time with you. I'm going to leave this uh, interview in exactly the order it occurred, where we dived into perhaps the deepest moment of the entire interview in the first two minutes, for me, in my experience. And then uh, somewhere in the last seven minutes, we got you introducing yourself and describing some of your background. Wow. So I love that we we went where we needed to go when we needed to go there, particularly by your last point about the importance of shadow work. Uh, I, of course, am com in completely aligned with what you've just laid out so beautifully and clearly. Um, perhaps that's pointing toward whenever we might be get be together in our next conversation. We could start uh, in the shadow world. That would be rich, I am sure. I'm going to go back for just a moment to that first moment of connection. It, it's hard for me to overstate how important that moment is and was, how much healing there was for questions I've been carrying that I wasn't experiencing that particular element of human connection, those, that particular dimension that has appeared to me to be activated in your sharing and in my receiving. There's something deeply reassuring that I can find someone so adept in the possibility management community with whom I can connect outside of the, the four feelings or the five bodies as we've talked about them. For me, that initial connection and moment occurred, including some of those things, but quite distinct as well. That, that nourished a part of me that was scared that I would not find it with y'all. So uh, I wish you a wonderful journey mm. in your time in Mexico. I thank you so much for the work that you do. <clears throat> and uh, I look forward to our next chats to connect. <laughs> Dean, thank you so much for having this conversation with me, for listening with such space for not just you, but for other people. You're listening, not just on your behalf, but on behalf of so many people. And it's such a great service 
and needed service in the world. So thank you so much for giving me the space to speak into. And as a, can I say parting comment about sure. this is, I, I have this thing that I've been researching recently, which is if you're doing all of this spiritual work or this transformational work, and it's not getting you to be more loving and empathetic and connected with yourself and with the planet and with other people, then I don't, I don't really believe that it's really transformational. Mm. Because for me, there's a difference and there's a choice. Do you want to be right or do you want to be in a relationship? Mm-hmm. And what I see you that it's that you that you were speaking to is to be in relationship, to be deeply in relationship with the plant world, with with the planet, with the soil, with the sun, with with the universe, with the people. Mm-hmm. That is a, a way that it's the way to your heart. And and I really appreciate that you brought that in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. it's so needed. So, so needed as so many people are hungry, are starving for that. Yeah. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. Also available on our website, www.livingresilience.net, is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.